One of the suttas we chanted just now was the Mangala Sutta. The word Mangala means blessing, it means protection. The story behind the sutta is a deva came to the, see the Buddha and asked the Buddha. People talk about protection, they talk about blessings. What is a real protection? What's a real blessing? And the Buddha goes down and gives a list, starting with very simple things. Not associating with fools, associating with wise people, and ultimately building up to complete awakening. The point being that blessings don't come from other things. They don't come from the stars. They don't come from the words of other people. They come from your actions. You protect yourself with your actions. You bless yourself with your actions. This is one of the reasons why we're here tonight, to send off the old year and welcome the new. By training the mind to be skillful, focusing on the good things we can do with the mind right here, right now, squeezing some more goodness out of the old year before it goes. Because that's one of the blessings that's listed in that sutta, the blessing of heedfulness. Realizing that time flows on, flows on. It's like a water faucet that you can't turn off, and it keeps flowing, flowing, flowing. And if you don't find use for the water, the water gets wasted. So here we are, finding use for this water of time, training the mind, because that's the Buddha's definition of an auspicious day, and of course that translates into an auspicious year. You're on top of what's happening in the mind right now, right now, and doing your duty. You know what the duties are, of course. They relate, on the one hand, to the teachings on skillful and unskillful action. If you see that the mind is doing anything unskillful, you're doing anything unskillful in your words or your deeds, you abandon that. And you give rise to skillful qualities instead. That principle, the Buddha said, is true across the board. Same with the Four Noble Truths. Each of them has a duty, too. You try to comprehend suffering. Abandon the cause, realize cessation by developing the path. So that's our duty right now. We're doing it. Focusing on the breath, we're trying to develop right mindfulness, right effort, right concentration. All that based on right view. These are all qualities of the path, factors of the path that we want to develop. So we use the breath as a gathering place for the mind. Be aware of where the breath comes in, where it goes out, where you feel it coming and going out, which may not be at the nose. Sometimes you feel the energy of the breath moving in different places in the body. To so try to gain a sense of when you breathe in, breathe out, how do you feel it? The Buddha is asking you to get very sensitive to how your body feels from within as a way of inhabiting the present moment. So we can observe the, the mind clearly in the present moment as well. But first you've got to inhabit it. You have to feel solid and well-based and at home here. Otherwise it's hard to observe anything. So think of what way of breathing might be comfortable. And if you've got something that already is comfortable, try to maintain it. Until it doesn't feel comfortable anymore, then make changes. Try to keep on top of what needs to be done. This is how you develop the basic qualities that are needed for concentration. Mindfulness, i.e. keeping something in mind. Alertness, watching what you're doing. And ardency, trying to do it well. So you're keeping the breath in mind, you're watching the mind and the breath at the same time to make sure they stay together. And if they slip off, the breath doesn't actually slip off. If the mind slips off, you immediately come back. As soon as you realize you've lost the breath, you come back. Let go of whatever thought it was. And if it's 
a thought they haven't completed, they'll leave it incomplete. Leave the ends dangling. You don't have to take care of every little thought that comes in the mind. All too often we're like spiders. We have to wrap up every little bug that comes in our, into our web. But if you spend all your time wrapping up the thoughts, you'll never get back to the breath. So leave the thoughts incomplete. Leave them tangling. You want to continue, continue the story of your breath coming in and going out, and the story of the mind settling down with the breath right now. While you're with the breath, try to be as sensitive as possible to how the breathing feels, not only in the main spot where it's most obvious, but as you begin to settle in, notice how it feels in different parts of the body as well. Can you coordinate the breathing sensations in the body? So when you breathe in, it feels like the whole body is being nourished. You breathe out, the whole body is being nourished. You don't squeeze the energy at the end of the out-breath. You don't pump it in and make it tight at the end of the in-breath. Allow things to flow evenly and smoothly. And you'll be ready to settle in. Now we're here in the present moment, not because it's a great place to stay, but it's an essential place to stay if you want to work on the mind. Because it's only here that you can actually observe the mind in action. In one sense, we're always in the present moment. It's simply that we're thinking about a thought in the present moment that refers to something else. But you want to be able to step out of those thought worlds and just be here in the current world of breathing in, breathing out, so you can see the thoughts as processes. And you want to see where it is that the thoughts that hook you, especially things like greed, aversion, delusion, fear, grief, jealousy. When they hook you, why do you go with them? What's the appeal? And if you go with them, what are the results? The Buddha himself said that he got on the right path to awakening when he learned how to divide his thoughts into two types. On the one hand, there were thoughts imbued with sensuality, ill will, harmfulness. Those were the unskillful ones. And then the skillful ones were the ones imbued with renunciation, in other words, not getting fascinated with thinking about sensual pleasures. Non-ill will, actually, thinking thoughts of goodwill and equanimity, and harmlessness, thoughts of compassion. So he judged his thoughts where they came from and where they went. If they're coming from the unskillful motivations, he would hold those thoughts in check, because he knew that they would, as he said, create a bend in the mind. The mind would be leaning and inclined in that direction again. The more you think about something, the more you bend in that direction. And the mind starts leaning over. It doesn't stand up straight and tall. But if the thoughts were motivated by renunciation, non-ill will, harmlessness, he let himself think those thoughts. But then after a while he realized that even if the thoughts were skillful, thinking about those things all the time would tire the mind. That's why he wanted to bring the mind into concentration. So the mind can have a place to rest. So create a sense of being here in the present moment, where you can rest in the present moment. Not that you're going to rest forever here. You want to rest to gather your strength, because the mind has been running around all over the place. And if it's going to do any decent work, it has to rest first. Then when it's rested, you start looking at what comes up in the mind and seeing where it's creating any unnecessary stress for itself. In the beginning, ideally, you want to see if there's any unnecessary stress in the concentration itself so you don't get distracted. It's the way you breathe placing a burden on you, because you breathe in a more refined way and still feel nourished by the breath. Or the way you visualize the breath to yourself, is that creating a problem? Sometimes you think the breath can come in and out only accompanied by certain sensations. And so you create those sensations, even though they're not necessary. If you can see that they're not necessary, 
allow them to relax. Think of a solvent going through the body and dissolving them away. And as you work on your perceptions and as you work on the actual mechanics of the breathing, and the mind begins to settle down more and more, you find that there's less and less need to breathe. You don't suppress the breath, but you just don't need to breathe in and out. Your oxygen needs are met one way or another. And the mind comes to more and more stillness. And there's less distraction even from the breath. The breath doesn't distract the mind. That's when the mind can see itself clearly. And that's the point we can start to observe it. And deal with even more refined issues as they come up. Because you'll begin to realize that greed, inversion, and delusion, when they come, they first come in little tiny whispers. And if you can catch the whisper and just breathe right through it, zap it, it doesn't have a chance to grow. This puts you more on top of things in the mind. It doesn't solve, <clears throat> totally solve the problem, but it clears the decks. So this becomes your place to stay. And whatever comes up, you can see it coming from a far distance away. It's a much safer place to be. So when the mind does get distracted, you can start asking questions about it, because you know you've got a better place to stay. Because all too often the reason we're distracted is because we don't know where to stay. There's no sense of pleasure. There's nothing to feed on. And so the mind's looking for a place to nibble on something. So something comes along, catches its fancy, and you're off. You want to be able to see that process, to see how do these things arise. When they leave, how do they leave? And that gives you a sense of what the cause is. And then you want to look at, at what the Buddha calls the allure, why you go for it. Say anger. All too often we know that. We do stupid things under the power of anger. Many times we want to get rid of it, but then we just keep going back to it again. Or with lust. Sometimes you've seen the drawbacks of lust, but you just keep going back again. Part of the reason is because you have nothing else, else to go to, nothing better to go to. So with the concentration, you try to provide yourself with something better. But even then, there's some allure that you're not seeing, some little hook in the mind that goes for these things. It th thinks it's going to get something out of them that it doesn't get. They lie to you, and you believe them 100 percent. So you want to learn how to see through those lies, that they don't provide the satisfaction that they promise, or the satisfaction that you think you get out of them. When you actually see in action, okay, this is why I go for that, and then you can compare that allure with the drawbacks of going. And if the mind is well established enough in concentration, it can see a lot more clearly what the relative weight is of all those things. And that's when you develop this passion. This way, insight is a value judgment. You look at the things you've been feeding on, and you finally realize it's not worth it. It's that sense of, it's not worth it, coupled with the fact that I don't have to. That's how you let go. And when you can do that, that's when you're having an auspicious day. Keep that up through the year, and you have an auspicious year. It comes from your actions, cleaning out your own house, and making it your resolve that your goodness is not going to depend on the world outside, whether the year outside is a good year or a bad year. There are a lot of things out there, a lot of people out there you cannot control. And 
If your happiness depends on the actions of other people, you're setting yourself up for a fall. You've got to find a resource inside. You've got to find a place inside where you can provide, provide and produce your own happiness. And you do it by cleaning out the mind in this way, getting an understanding of what's going on. So the mind doesn't lie to itself anymore, doesn't fool itself anymore. Because if you go for these little pleasures that come from these states of mind, you're missing out on a much larger pleasure, much larger happiness that can be found inside. The Buddha is not telling you to let go of these things because he's a harsh or stern taskmaster. It's because there is a better happiness in life. And if you're willing to give up the, your normal feeding habits and retrain your hunger, have a hunger for something that's really solid, or what the Buddha called the noble search. He said, most of us search for things that are going to age, grow ill, or die. Either that or will age, grow ill, and die before they go. And if our life is devoted to that, there's nothing really noble about the life. But if we search for something that's free from aging, illness, and death, that's a noble activity, a noble search. That's what gives nobility to your life. It makes all your time auspicious. It depends on your own resolve. Nobody else encourages you. Remember the Buddha in, in his time, nobody encouraged him on his path. This is a desire that has to come from within, but it's a goodness that comes from within, and you want to nurture that. Because it allows you to find a happiness that comes from within that nothing else can touch. That, as the Buddha said, is the ultimate blessing, the ultimate protection. When touched by the ways of the world, as the, as the verse says, the mind does not shake. Things come and go, gain, loss, status, loss of status, pleasure, pain, praise, criticism. The mind has something that is not touched by these things at all. And that's when it gets really good. <laughs>